1915, Great Britain found itself locked into a major European land war for the first time in over a century. It was a war which Britain was not strategically, militarily, economically or even psychologically prepared. Britain had entered the war in 1914 perhaps expecting a comparatively short, albeit violent, conflict against the German Empire. This expectation had been dashed. Although the British Army had fought very hard in defence of Belgium and France in 1914, this had come at an enormous cost in casualties. The British Army had suffered some 95,000 casualties from its pre-war strength of just under 250,000 men, representing 38% of Britain's pre-war army strength. And yet, these casualties had only produced a deadlock on the Western Front, a front that now stretched from the Channel Coast in the north to the Swiss border in the south, 400 miles of continuous fortification without any flanks to turn. Furthermore, Germany had been left in possession of large swathes of northern France and almost the entirety of Belgium. There was no prospect, therefore, of the war ending at the end of 1914. Germany had captured territory which it would be unwilling to surrender, and although its invasion had been stopped short of Paris, it was clear that the war would continue. Therefore, Britain's expectations had been challenged and dismissed. Instead, British war leaders found themselves facing a series of thorny dilemmas that would dictate Britain's strategic and military conduct in the coming year. Essentially, there were three dilemmas that underpinned Britain's war planning in 1915. The first and the most obvious was the strategic problem Britain faced. Her pre-war armies had been gravely damaged by the fighting of 1914, and now they faced the unenviable prospect of assaulting the greatest fortification system seen in military history, the Western Front. Britain's war leaders were not positive about their ability to breach these lines. Prime Minister Herbert Asquith felt that the offensives on the Western Front would result in a tremendous loss of life and indeed a tremendous waste of money. He was supported by his Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, who felt that any attempt to carry the fortifications on the Western Front would only end in disappointment and loss of life. Rather than fighting on the Western Front, Britain's war leaders sought easier victories elsewhere, particularly against the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. This was, of course, a favoured project of Winston Churchill, and would ultimately lead to the disastrous Dardanelles expedition. We get a sense that Britain's War Council wished to avoid the dilemma of fighting on the Western Front, a front where it was not expected victory would be achieved easily, if at all. And yet this is where the second dilemma comes into play, and this was the dilemma of alliance. Britain did not fight the First World War on its own. Instead, it was locked into an alliance system with France, Russia and indeed Serbia in the east. In 1915, these allies were fighting for national survival. France had large portions of its territory occupied by the German invader, and at its closest point, the German army was a mere five days' march from Paris, the capital. Leaving the Germans unmolested in the Western Front was therefore anathema to the French army. Furthermore, in the east, the Russians and the Serbians were facing major German and Austro-Hungarian offensives that were costing them thousands of casualties and hundreds of miles of territory. Britain's eastern allies could not be allowed to suffer without Britain contributing direct military support to the campaign. Indeed, as early as April 1915, British diplomats reported that the talk in St. Petersburg was that Britain was willing to fight until the last drop of Russian blood had been spilt. Adding to the danger was the news gathered through British intelligence sources that Germany was seeking to conclude a separate peace deal with France or Russia, detaching them from the alliance and breaking the alliance bloc into its separate parts. If Britain was to lose an ally, a major ally, in 1915, it would be disastrous for the war cause. Therefore, Britain had both a moral and a strategic obligation to fight in support of its allies, and the best place in which blows could be struck against Germany, as opposed to the Ottoman Empire, was of course the Western Front, that front which the Britain's war leaders were so desperate to avoid entanglement with. This, however, led to the third and final great dilemma faced by Britain's war leaders in 1915, and this was the military dilemma. Britain simply lacked the military resources to carry out a major campaign on the Western Front. The regular army had fought exceedingly well in 1914, but it had come at a dreadful cost in casualties. These pre-trained regulars could not be replaced easily, if indeed at all. 
Britain's great military strength was its navy, and although a blockade had been imposed on Germany, this would take many months, if not years, to have a serious military effect. Instead, the small and severely battered British army would have to carry the weight of action on the Western Front. It was short of manpower, it was short of experience, it was short of supplies, and in short, the British Army was not in a condition to contribute to a life or death struggle for national survival on the Western Front in 1915. Yet the pressures of alliance, the need to support Russia and France in their battle against Germany, forced the British Army to contribute to these campaigns. And this led to the harsh reality that the Army was simply unprepared for the type of fighting it was about to face. So what of the British Army in the Western Front? In 1915, it was undergoing two contrasting experiences. On one hand, the old regular army was attempting to regenerate its strength after the enormous battles of 1914. It was recalling colonial garrisons back to Britain and then sending them out to the Western Front as soon as they were ready. Casualties on the Western Front had to be replaced so that Britain could continue to hold its trenches. The army in France consisted of four quite distinct elements in 1915. The core of it was the pre-war regulars. These were volunteer soldiers who had joined before the First World War, had been professional soldiers, had undergone a considerable degree of training, but they were an irreplaceable asset. Training now could not be carried out on the same level it had been in peacetime. Regulars were thrown into battle as soon as they arrived from their colonial garrisons, and every battle they fought reduced their strength a little more, and these men could not be replaced. So the regulars were in decline. They were supported by another regular force, and this of course was the Indian Army, which had come out to join them in October 1914. Just like their regular comrades, the Indian Army was an all-volunteer force, trained and recruited before the First World War, specialising in hill warfare, a specialism which did not always prove ideal for the confused and chaotic conditions of the Western Front. But nevertheless, in terms of training, the Indian Army was the next strongest element of the British Army in France. And yet, just like the regulars, they too were a wasting asset. Supplementing the regulars and the Indian troops were the territorials. These were part-time soldiers before the First World War, sometimes and unfairly dismissed as Saturday night soldiers, given that they tended to only train at weekends. The quality of the territorials varied enormously. There's little doubt that they were patriotic and committed and had at least had some modicum of training, but they varied very much from unit to unit about how effective they were. Some were undoubtedly very good, others less so. What is also true is that these territorials were also suffering the same wastage that afflicted the regulars and the Indians. Every battle reduced their numbers a little more. Every engagement took away some of their fighting strength and reduced their capabilities. By the end of the year, the regulars, the Indians and the territorials would be almost unrecognisable from the force that began, worn down by casualties and the constant, incessant fighting of much of the Western Front. So what was the fourth element that underpinned the armies in 1915? This was, of course, entirely new volunteer troops, primarily the new armies, which were being raised in the UK and began to filter out into the Western Front in May 1915. These were patriotic volunteers, undoubtedly committed to the cause, often drawn from walks of life that did not normally enter the army, such as the professional classes or the educated classes. They certainly had great potential, but they did not have the level of training that the regulars, Indians, or even the territorials had enjoyed before the First World War. They were an untried quantity, and the only way which they would learn and in which they would become effective was, of course, the hard school of battle. Assisting the new armies, and of similar type, were, of course, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, an all-volunteer force from Canada. And although it was underpinned by the Canadian militia, which had undergone some training prior to the First World War, the Canadians, much as the new army divisions were, were an untrained, untried and untested combat force. The new army, the Canadians, would have to learn in the hard field of war, and these lessons could only be bought in blood. What type of battlefield 
did these new troops face? It was one that somewhat perplexed the British Army, but perhaps not to the extent which it has sometimes been argued. Britain had fought against trenches in the past, most notably in the Boer War of 1899-1902, and it had studied the supposed lessons of the Russo-Japanese War, a war that had been defined by trench warfare and which had occurred ten years before. Quite quickly, therefore, the British Army understood the basic problems of the Western Front, namely that no matter how strong the German defences were, they could be broken into if a sufficiently heavy artillery bombardment was delivered on them beforehand, a bombardment that would sever barbed wire, suppress the defenders, knock out German machine guns and artillery, and allow the infantry to advance. Britain did not possess sufficient guns or ammunition to carry out such a bombardment. And therefore, if the bombardment failed, the infantry would be forced to assault into unbroken German defences with undoubtedly tragic consequences. What the army therefore needed, more than anything else, was time. Time to assemble its military might, to grow its artillery stocks, to create stockpiles of ammunition, and of course to train the inexperienced troops which were now coming to the Western Front in ever greater numbers, and to preserve that hardened, experienced corps of regulars, Indians, and even territorials that could add an experienced edge to the new armies the need to support Russia and Serbia, and indeed to assist the French in their enormous offensives, was pressing. It was not possible for Britain to turn around and tell her allies that it was not prepared to carry out a major offensive. It simply had to carry out these offensives with whatever resources were available. And it was this pressure to do something, even at short notice, that ultimately led the British Army into so many setbacks, defeats, and indeed disasters in 1915. Indeed, as a whole, the German army was far better equipped for trench warfare than was the British. The Germans had plentiful machine guns, trench mortars that could deliver high angle, indirect fire that dropped directly into British positions, not to mention a far greater stock of artillery. In the middle of 1915, Britain was able to muster approximately 65 heavy artillery pieces, outnumbered almost 10 to 1. The Germans were better equipped, they were better positioned, for they had taken the high ground on the Western Front and constructed defensive positions around it, and they were better trained than the inexperienced British Army, the New Army and the Canadians, that was coming out in ever greater numbers. And as the official historian of the First World War, James Edmonds admitted, there is no shame in acknowledging that the Germans had the best of the fighting in 1915. The prophecies, therefore, of Britain's war leaders made at the start of 1915 that the Western Front would prove impregnable and that it could only be breached by an enormous cost in lives had proved accurate. And despite much courage, there would be no glory for the British Army on the Western Front in 1915. If you'd like to learn more about Britain's war effort in 1915, take a look at my book, Courage Without Glory, The British Army on the Western Front, 1915.